Mutations are the engine of evolution. It's through mutations that we get the variation within species that leads to adaptation and even speciation. However, one particular area of evolutionary biology has always remained controversial, which is the evolution of complex traits, with some opponents of evolution stating that it would be impossible for evolutionary processes through mutations and natural selection to lead to the appearance of complex traits such as certain behaviors, molecular pathways, or physical structures. In this video, we'll explore what types of mutations impact species and how these mutations can lead to the evolution of complex traits and show you why there really is no controversy once you understand how these processes work. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. As I said in the intro, today we're going to talk about mutations and how mutations can lead to the evolution of complex traits. Now, when we talk about complex traits, we're talking about things like certain behaviors or physical structures such as bacteria flagellum or eyes that are very complex in nature and that some opponents of evolution would simply state are irreducibly complex. So this argument of irreducible complexity simply states that certain structures are so complex that if even a small part of them is disrupted, the entire, the entire structure itself is useless. This would then state then that it would be impossible for these, these uh, structures to have evolved through evolutionary processes because one of two things would have to happen. Either uh, they, these, they would have to evolve through a series of steps that would render them essentially useless uh, until they got to the final structure or the entire structure would have to evolve into existence all at once. Neither of these is something that could be prescribed by evolutionary theory. However, as we will come to see, the argument from irreducible complexity uh, really doesn't hold a lot of water. Because we could sum the argument for irreducible complexity up into sort of one simple statement. What good is half a something? So in other words, what good is half an eye? Or what good is half of a bacterial flagellum? Well, we'll actually answer that question later on in the video, but we'll also see that the argument of irreducible complexity is, as Richard Dawkins likes to refer to it, more akin to the argument from personal incredulity. In other words, it basically is someone that lacks it comes from someone who lacks the imagination to see how evolutionary processes could have through a stepwise process led to the evolution of complex traits so let's start by introducing what mutations are and how they function so a mutation of course is a change in a dna sequence within a genome typically that dna sequence is going to be in a region of that genome uh, known as a gene because genes encode proteins and it's really proteins that are the functional output of the genomic information that are going to influence uh, what, how a species evolves over time. That's not exclusively true, but it's okay if we just sort of go with that for this particular conversation. Now, mutations come in many different forms. Uh, you can have point mutations where, uh, where uh, an A nucleotide is changed for a G nucleotide. Or you can have insertions or deletions uh, where you remove certain nucleotides or add in certain nucleotides. You can have eversions. You can even have big effects on chromosomes like chromosomal translocations where part of one chromosome gets attached to another part of a different chromosome. Uh, you can have chromosomal duplications, uh, for example, where you end up with more than two copies of, in, in, uh, of a single chromosome uh, in a diploid genome. The bottom line is what's going to happen when you end up with these particular mutations is it has the possibility to influence the phenotype of the individual who possesses that mutation. Now, when it comes to the evolution of complex traits, what we're going to mainly focus on is a type of mutation known as a gene duplication. So gene duplications occur when a region of a genome that includes one or more genes during the process of typically during replication it could also occur uh, as a result of dna repair following damage so exposure to chemical mutagens or radiation for example can trigger this um, but essentially what happens is a region of the genome that includes one or more genes essentially gets duplicated so now instead of having one copy of those genes you now have two copies of those genes well two copies in diploid so but you get what i'm saying in other words you have two copies of that particular region of the genome running around within that individual so how could this potentially lead to the evolution of complex traits? Well, essentially, when you end up getting this duplicated region of the genome, 
at first is probably not going to have any effect at all. It's going to be what we would refer to as being evolutionarily neutral. Unless, of course, there's some sort of dosage effect of having too much of that particular gene product or gene products running around. But in general, it's not going to have any effect at all because essentially what you have is multiple copies of a fully functioning gene, and those copies are initially identical to each other. But one of the things that we know is going to happen over time is mutations are going to occur, and they're going to occur randomly. Now, of course, mutations in general are likely not to contribute to the improvement of uh, any one particular gene or the survival of the individual who possesses that mutation, but in some cases it does happen. But here's the thing, regardless of what happens with one copy of that gene, as long as you have the duplicated copy running around that's fully intact and unmutated and functioning properly, there's never going to be a penalty to the individual who possesses that mutation. So over time, what often happens when you have gene duplications is uh, there, there are multiple things that can happen. First off, one copy of the gene could just become non-functional. So it's called non-functionalization. One just mutates itself sort of into oblivion and becomes a pseudogene that looks very similar to a fully functional gene and essentially nothing comes of it. You can also get neo-functionalism. So sometimes what happens is that second copy of that gene uh, actually develops a new function. So for example, it could be, uh, let's say it's a gene that encodes a transporter. Well, this particular transporter, uh, let's say it imports calcium. Well, all of a sudden, this one mutates slightly and it produces a protein that's not as good at transporting calcium, but now it also transports magnesium at higher affinity. So now you have two transporters running around uh, and that could be advantageous. Or it could be something that encodes, uh, for example, an olfactory receptor, a protein that helps you detect scents or odors in the environment. Well, what's better than being able to smell one thing? Being able to smell two things. So you get that neo-functionalism where it's able to do that. Sometimes you get some functionalization. So sub-functionalization occurs when, uh, let's say that the gene product does one particular job. You know, maybe it, it not only moves a solute across, but it also acts as its own gate to make sure uh, that it only goes across at a certain time. Well, now you've got sub-functionalization. You have two proteins. One does the job of actually transporting the solute, while the other does the job of making sure it's the appropriate time to transport the solute. Or maybe it helps to turn a one enzyme pathway into a two enzyme pathway. One, the original protein does the first step in the enzymatic pathway. The second protein now does the second step. It allows them to improve their efficiency. They'll get very good at doing one task because they can forget about doing the other task over evolutionary time. Another example is they both just kind of remain intact doing their own things. Uh, this is basically essentially conservation. Uh, they just don't actually change what they're doing. They both continue to do the same thing and you end up with just more of that protein around or maybe not even more of that protein if the gene is... Uh, the gene is actually still functioning appropriately. The bottom line is as long as you have one good copy of that gene around, the other gene has the potential to evolve and do something new that could possibly provide an evolutionary advantage to that species. This is going to be particularly important because when we start looking at the evolution of complex traits, often what we're going to see is when we look at a complex structure, for example, the bacteri bacterial flagellum, we'll actually see that uh, the components of that supposedly irreducibly complex bacterial flagellum actually are all very closely related to each other. So let's actually look at that example. The bacterial flagellum is a complex structure consisting of many proteins found in the membrane of several species of bacteria, and it is used, like flagella and eukaryotes, to help keep them motile, to allow them to move. Now, not all bacteria have flagella, uh, only some do, but they all operate basically in the same way, and they all exist mostly of the same structures, which argues the fact that the flagellum actually evolved a single time in the history of bacteria, and that those that possess them uh, got them through some genetic means that tie them back to the original uh, common ancestor that had the bacterial flagellum. Now, anti-evolutionists have argued for a long time that the bacterial flagellum is irreducibly complex. They would say, look at all these different proteins in there. If one of them isn't doing their job appropriately, then the flagellum can't move, uh, do its job. Therefore, the bacteria can't move. Therefore, they either all had to come into existence all at once, which goes against evolutionary doctrine, or at some point there had to be a half of flagellum running around that wasn't functional, which also seems to go against the evolutionary dogma. But let's see why that's not the case. So based with this, faced with this challenge, uh, evolutionary biologists actually sought out to learn a lot more about the bacterial flagellum and learn how we could actually show that, of course, the bacterial flagellum evolved just like every other complex structure in living things.
and that's the thing I kind of want to point out is that the argument from irreducibly irreducible complexity has been used to highlight a number of different things in a number of different species. And every single time it's put out there, we find an evolutionary explanation for how this particular structure could have evolved naturally. The bacteriophagellum is no, no exception. So let's take a look at that. So when we look at the bacteriophagellum, we see that there are lots of different proteins in there. But when we look at the molecular and the genetic data, about what these proteins actually look like, what the genes that encode them look like, we find something very interesting. What we find is that almost every single protein or every single gene that encodes that protein uh, in the bacteriophagellum is closely related to another group of membrane proteins known as the type 3 secretion system. Now, the type 3 secretion system is present in almost every single species of bacteria, which argues that it's a very, very ancient uh, system of being able to secrete things from the cell into the environment. The fact that almost all bacteria have them, even those that don't have flagella, um, and argues that it was something that was probably present in the last common ancestor of all modern bacteria. What likely happened, and based on looking at the genetic analysis, we can clearly see that this is actually the result of a gene duplication event at some point a few billion years ago. The type 3 secretion system proteins actually got duplicated, and in at least one species, or at least one individual, that particular uh, those particular mutations led to actually becoming a somewhat motile version of a protein. And over a series of mutations, this type 3 secretion system actually became a very primitive flagellum and then likely over time evolved to be better adapted because there's a selection pressure on it now, right? Because now you go from a being uh, a bacterium that can't move to being the only species of bacteria that can move because you're the only one with a flagellum which means that that's a, huge re that's a huge advantage, right? So there would actually be selection pressure now to actually evolve better motility, to have better ability to use your flagellum. Moreover, the argument for irreducible complexity doesn't actually hold water when it comes to the bacterial flagellum at all. First and foremost, we, know, we now know through this research that you can actually mutate several different components of the bacterial flagellum, rendering those components not functional, but the flagellum still works perfectly fine and the bacterial are still motile. A further examination of other bacterial species that do have a flagellum, note that they are likely through reductive evolution missing several pieces of their flagellum and yet they also retain the ability to use those flagellum and are highly motile. Now the bacterial flagellum is just one example, but I need to stress that time and time again, this argument from irreducible complexity really doesn't hold any water and we can always propose one if not several different evolutionary processes by which uh, these particular complex traits have evolved. Typically, these, the evolution of complex traits is going to result from the, the occurrence of gene duplications. Now, the one thing I would note is that we have lots and lots of evidence and examples of gene duplications throughout evolutionary history. One of the most studied examples that can also help to explain the evolution of complex traits as well as complex body plans is what occurred with the Hox family of transcription factors. So Hox genes, H-O-X, which is short for homeobox, it refers to a particular sequence within the genes that they regulate, that they bind to, okay? So they're called uh, Hox genes. Now, if we look at Hox genes throughout evolutionary history, we find that Hox genes first evolved uh, very early on in, in the lives of multicellular organisms. It appears to evolve uh, prior to the divergence between plants and modern day animals. So a very long time ago, at least a few hundred, at least several hundreds of millions of years ago. This is evidenced by the fact that both plants and even the simplest of animals, sponges, possess a single Hox gene. Now, Hox genes encode proteins that are called transcription factors, and transcription factors are important for regulating the expression of other genes. When it comes to Hox genes, the genes that they're going to regulate are actually genes that are involved in the spatiotemporal patterning of development. In other words, they turn on genes that are important for development, and they do so in a regulated manner to make sure that only genes that need to be on or on at any given time and in the right cell types. And as a result, if you mutate Hox genes, you can end up with a whole host of developmental abnormalities from the duplication of certain gene segments to the duplication of certain limbs to the complete absence of limbs, depending on what mutation in what gene and when you actually inactivate those particular Hox genes. So they are incredibly important. And one of the things we know is that every multicellular organism has at least one Hox gene. What's very interesting is when you go up from the relatively simple sponges and you start getting into species that are more complex that have multiple tissue layers like nadaria, and then you eventually get into the bilaterians uh, like vertebrates and invertebrate species like arthropods, you start to see the number of Hox genes jump from a single to a pair in nadarians 
to dozens when you get up to uh, the chordates uh, and the vertebrates uh, like human beings. We see dozens of different Hox genes. Now we know that there's, these are the result of gene duplications and the reason we know this is we can analyze the gene sequences. When you're dealing with genes that have thousands of nucleotides and proteins that have thousands of amino acids, it's pretty easy to look and say that there's just so much similarity between these genes that it can't be the result of sheer randomness. They not only perform the same function, but just like we see with the tetrapod limb plan, these are truly homologous structures. They are related to each other through an evolutionary past. But what's, what's interesting from a complexity standpoint is as we go up in the relative complexity of these organisms, getting into bilateral symmetry, three different germ layers, uh, segmentation, so on and so forth, that also correlates very well with the uh, complexity of the number of Hox genes they have. Now, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but what it does show, and we'll talk about this later on in a different video when we talk about development, is that the ability uh, to have multiple Hox genes provides some type of genetic flexibility that allows for the evolution of complex body plans. It allows for more pinpoint regulation of, of developmental patterning, which would be required if you're going to go from an asymmetric, non-tissue-bearing uh, sponge to a very complex, symmetric, segmented, bilaterally symmetrical uh, animal with three different tissue layers. So Hox genes provide an example of not only a known gene duplication that has occurred over hundreds of millions of years, actually it's a series of gene duplications, but also how that contributes to the complexity of, of life itself. Another classic example from the world of animals are genes known as olfactory receptors or OR genes. Now, animals possess, particularly vertebrates, possess a whole host of, of, of olfactory receptors. Um, they range uh, from very few uh, in, in, in some animals to uh, over 4,000 in elephants. Now, what's interesting is all of these olfactory receptors to be, seem to be related to each other in one way or another. It likely is the case that a single olfactory receptor gene evolved in a species that allowed it to smell something. Now, remember, in, when you live in a world where nothing can be smelled and you're the only thing that can smell something, that's a pretty big advantage. Over time, you ended up getting a, a series of, of gene duplications, and then you would likely get specialization events and you know, functionalization events where, you know, not only can I smell something, I can smell two things, and one thing's good and one thing's bad. And over time, you start to refine that. Now, of course, what we see when we look at animals that navigate their world um, predominantly through a sense of smell, uh, species like rats, dogs, cats, th mice, things like that, we see a fairly large number of OR genes. We see uh, you know, upwards of 14 to 1,800 in certain species. Elephants, for example, have over 4,000 olfactory receptors. But what's really interesting is what happens in species that are descended from those that used to navigate that way, but now navigate their world strictly through their eyes, or mainly through their eyes. Let's look at humans, for example. Human genome actually contains about 800 different OR, uh, OR genes. However, only about 400 of them are still functional. The other half, the other 400 of them, are now rendered as pseudogenes, just useless wrecks of genes that used to be functional exist. This is likely the result of the fact that primates in general, and this seems to be a feature of the entire primate lineage, navigate their world mainly through the fact that they have color vision. We use our eyes to get from place to place, whereas rats, mice, dogs typically use their noses. If you want an extreme example of this, let's look at dolphins. Uh, dolphins, again, have lots of different uh, pseudogenes encoding uh, uh, olfactory receptors, but they really only have about 25 functional ORFs or OR genes. Why would that be the case? If you're a dolphin, first off, remember your nostrils in the middle of your forehead now. It's your blowhole. And secondly, there's really not much to smell underwater, especially if you're an air-breathing animal uh, that can't smell underwater. So maybe they get a quick whiff through their blowhole when they get up to the surface. I don't know. I'm not a dolphin, and I don't have a blowhole. But bottom line is they don't navigate their world by scent at all, which explains why most of their OR genes are now pseudogenes. So wrapping this conversation up, uh, it's very easy to see how complex traits could evolve over time. We see the same thing when we look, for example, at complex behaviors. Uh, we also can see the same thing when we look at uh, large enzymatic pathways. We often see that the enzymes involved in enzymatic pathways, uh, the genes themselves are actually relatives of each other, likely the result of gene duplication events and then subsequent neo-functionalization, specialization, uh, or, or cooperation between the resulting genes. So it really is no mystery how evolution can explain the evolution of complex traits. It shouldn't come as any surprise as we have evolution does explain a lot of uh, pretty much everything about how life exists on the planet Earth as we know it. 
what I'd like to do is just close and just simply say that the argument from irreducible complexity really isn't a good argument at all. You may hear it from time to time, but it doesn't hold a lot of water. It simply comes down to the fact that sometimes people look at things that are pretty amazing and pretty awesome and simply say that I just don't understand how evolution could have led to that. Well, now we're back to the argument of in individual incredulity. Just because you can't think of a way that it could have evolved doesn't mean it couldn't have evolved. It also doesn't mean that someone else hasn't already figured out a way in which that thing evolved. Another classic example of this are eyes. Uh, quite often people look at an eye and say, man, that is a very complex structure that does a pretty wonderful, important thing for life. And I can't even imagine what half an eye would actually be good for. Well, there you have it again. The eyes themselves are, I mean, first off, we have to ask this question. What type of eye are we talking about? Are we talking about a human eye? Are we talking about an octopus's eye or a nautiloid eye? Are we talking about the eye spots on a planarium? Are we talking about the compound eye of, of an arthropod, like an insect? I mean, there are like 30 or 40 different kinds of eyes. And as far as we can tell, vision has evolved over 30 different times in animal species over time. In other words, when you look at eyes, you're actually looking at a series of, of convergent evolution. They're not homologs. They're actually um, analogs. They're, they're actually just the result of convergent evolution. And the reason why is it turns out seeing things is actually a pretty good idea evolutionarily. But regardless of which type of eye we're talking about, it's fairly easy to explain where eyes and how eyes could have evolved. I mean, there's actually been several papers written about this that describe how the, how the squid eye evolved and how human eyes may have evolved. But to answer the question of what good is half an eye, uh, let's just look at the planaria as an example. If you look at the eye spots on a planaria, uh, they can basically distinguish things that are light and things that are shadow. And that's really it. But when you live in a world where most of the things around you can't even see that, that's a pretty awesome adaptation to have, to know that there once was light and now there's not, and maybe that's the result of something chasing me. Remember, as they always say, in the land of the blind, the man with one eye is king. So there you have it, the evolution of complex traits through gene mutations, most specifically gene duplications in most cases. If you want to remind yourself of what types of mutations exist, how they occur, uh, I would encourage you to go back and look at some of my other videos. I did a whole video uh, about mutations, the causes of mutations, and what they actually look like, and how they can actually impact proteins and species themselves. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you learned a lot, and I will talk to you real soon. Bye!